Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see so many of you uh, here this early this morning. God is good? All the time. All the time? All is good. Now, my voice is not too great, but I'll try to speak. I have been dealing with a little bit of a sore throat ever since I got here. And that is one of the reasons why I was not able to address you last evening. One thing I would like to say before I share this devotional with you is, uh, while I do appreciate the uh, warm welcome yesterday, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, I do appreciate that, but I would like to also uh, remind you that uh, there's only one man that deserves honor and glory and praise. And that one man is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? I am just a mortal man just like you. I'm just a fellow passenger just like you on our way by the grace of God to the promised land. Amen? I would, I would like for you to remember that. I am not a celebrity. I am uh, not... Uh, a Hollywood star, as they would say in the United States. I am just a sinner, just like everybody else who is being saved by grace. Amen? We'd like for you to remember that. Do not praise any man. Do not worship any man. Worship the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only. Now, beside my sore throat. I have been having difficulties as well to, to sleep because I cannot sleep when it's so hot. I like the hot weather during the daytime, but I do not like it at nighttime. It is hard for me to sleep. I was up, I believe it was uh, shortly after midnight last night because I could not sleep. So once again, Besides the weather, I am very thankful by the grace of God to be here with you and to share the word of God with you. Amen? Amen. I am also thank thankful because of so many of you here that have been watching the videos and from the testimonies that I've heard. That, that is one of the reasons why this group is here and many others around this beautiful country and we give God the honor and glory and praise for that because he deserves it and as the truth is being spread abroad and I believe just like during the days of the apostles during the days of the disciples many more will come out from the world and from the organization and they will make a stand for Jesus Christ. We have been called to be reformers. Amen? Reformers. Do we understand what that means? Now before I get into this, I would like to invite you to bow with me and we're going to have another word of prayer. Loving Father God, which are in heaven, help us, Father, to understand the truth as it is found in Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for giving us this opportunity this morning to learn of you. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell us that the truth shall set us free. What will set us free? It is the truth that will set us free. And keep in mind that the truth represents Jesus Christ. As I stated a moment ago, we are reformers. We've been called to be reformers. I would like to take your mind back to the days of the Dark Ages. The days during the time when the Roman Catholic Church was ruling not only the world, but also the consciences of men. And many came up, rise up, men like Martin Luther, men like John Huss, Jerome, and many others, they started a protest against the Roman Catholic Church. 
Those men were called reformers. Now, why were they called reformers? Well, it is because primarily they were studying the Word of God. They discovered the Word of God. For example, Martin Luther discovered that the just shall live by faith. That salvation was not by the works of men. It was only by the merit of Jesus Christ. So when Martin Luther discovered that the just shall live by faith and not by works, then he started to compare what the Bible had to say with the Roman Catholic Church teaching. And he saw many contradictions there. And as a result of the contradictions, he started to teach people within the Roman Catholic Church about what the Bible says. But they would not listen to what he had to say. They had put tradition above the Word of God. And as a result of that, he started what we now know as the protests. He was protesting against the Roman Catholic Church because while they claimed to be Christians, yet they were not following what the Bible says. Hence, the Reformation movement. Hence, Martin Luther started to protest by nailing 95 theses of the door on the door of Wittenberg against the Roman Catholic Church. Now Martin Luther wanted the church to go by the Bible and the Bible only. Reformers, Seventh day Adventists came into the scene in the midst of 1800, where the reformers, men like John Huss, Calvin, Martin, uh, Martin Luther, those who followed them, where they stopped. God raised the Seventh day Adventist Church to continue the reform movement. You see, Martin Luther and many others did not discover all the truths. And one of the reasons why they did not discover all the truth is because they got to a point where they stopped. They stopped, they did not continue to reform. And that is one of the reasons why God had to raise another movement. And that movement was the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the midst of 1800, this was shortly after the great disappointment of 1844, October 22nd, 1844. God raised a people to go back to the Bible. And as we are heading towards the heavenly Canaan, God wanted his people not just to discover the Sabbath reform, the sanctuary reform, the Ten Commandments reform, but all the reforms that the Bible teach or teaches. Yeah. All of it, not just part of it, but all of it. But just like those who follow Martin Luther's teachings, the Calvinists, they stop to reform. We as a people, in spite of the fact that God has given us many truths about the Bible, about all the reforms that need to take place before we can enter Canaan, we have allowed the General Conference of Seven Adventists as well to stop us from reforming. Now we're going to talk about reform. We are zealous for present truth. We love the present truth. Amen. We love to talk about Bible prophecies. We love to see and hear how the prophecies are being fulfilled in our world today. But there is something that is lacking among us. And I believe I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And it has to do with reform. To begin with, let me read you a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And it goes like this Whether ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory 
of God. The Bible says, whatever we do in our lives, whether if it's drinking or eating, we must do it all for what reason? To the glory of God. That is telling me that in everything that we do, whether the clothes that we put on, we choose to put on, we must be thinking first, will that glorify God? That's what the Bible says. The food that we eat, we must be thinking first, will that glorify God? What we drink, we must be thinking first about how God thinks about it. Amen? God, in other words, what the passage tells us, God comes first in everything. God comes what? First in everything. This is something that many of us don't think about deeply. We don't think about the clothes that we wear. Will that glorify God? But what we find here in the Bible, it says, In whatsoever ye do, do it all to the glory of God. All, not just some. The Bible did, did not make a distinction. It says, to the glory of God. Includes even places that we go to. As Christians, we should be careful to what we listen to. I'm talking about worldly music and what we watch. Will that glorify God? If I listen to th this type of music, will it glorify God? Is that kind of music uplifting and glorify God? Or what about movies of this world, televisions and things like that? Will that glorify God? This is the reason why the book of Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the Bible there also says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You present your body as living sacrifice. Now, why should we present our bodies as living sacrifice? Sacrifice. Well, the Bible went on to tell us in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's the reason why. It says there, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And the Bible went on to tell us, ye were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Ye were bought with a price, glorify God in your body. So in whatsoever ye do, remember that this body is not yours. You were bought with a price. What was the price that was paid for your body? What was the price? It was the life of Jesus Christ. Body of Jesus Christ. That was nailed on the cross for you and I. It was bruised. The same body that was bruised for you and I. His blood that he shed. On Calvary's cross for you and I. That was the price that was paid for your ransom to buy you back. And so, therefore, in whatsoever we do, we have to look at the cross, the Calvary. Calvary. We have to remember, as Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We have to look at Calvary. We have to look at the price. 
that was paid for us. And then, if we are truly mournful, sorrowful, and understand what Jesus has done for us, then before we do anything, we will try to seek for the will of God first. Before we put anything on the body and into the body, we will seek to know first, will that glorify God? That is the reason why the apostle again says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, which dwelleth in you. Now keep in mind, the temple of God, nothing could enter it that will defile it. Nothing. It had to be pure. It had to be holy. That's what the Bible teaches about the temple of God. In order for God to dwell in that temple, that temple must remain pure and defiled. Now, we're not talking about a little physical temple like Solomon built. We're talking about the temple of our body. God wants to dwell inside that temple. But God cannot dwell in an unclean vessel, in an unclean temple. God is calling us to reform. Now, it's very basic if we were to go, for example, to the book of Genesis. Very basic. To understand what that means, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, there the Bible tells us in verse 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God hath not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. And then after that, the Bible tells us that God created the man, which was Adam. Now notice carefully, God created the man which was Adam. And God, the Bible tells us, he placed the man in the garden. Go to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden ye may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God said, he established the health laws in the Garden of Eden. Now keep in mind, when God established the health reform laws, this was in a world without sin. Think about that for a moment. In a world without sin, God established the health laws. There God says, this was good to eat, but this one was not good to eat. Now imagine, in a world that was pure, in a world that knew no sin. That was the days of Adam there. Now compare that world with our world today. We have been living in a world full of sin for the past 6,000 years. There has been a lot of pollution. A lot of things that have taken place in our world today. What God said there, what he established there, has a more direct application for us because we have been living in a world full of sin. So it's more for us than it was for Adam. Now keep in mind, the reason why we got into this sin problem is because somebody defiled their bodies. Who was that person who did that? That was Eve. God said, that's not good to eat. But Eve listened to the voice of the serpent and she ate it. And Adam also, knowing full well that Eve had sinned against God, Adam also took of the fruit and he defiled himself. Ever since then, God has been calling men back to health reform, and temperance in all things. Now, to understand how significant this is, 
Esau lost his birthright over food. Amen? So food has a lot to do with your salvation. Did you know that? It's because of food we got into this mess of sin. It's because of food. Esau lost his birthright because of food. He could not exercise temperance. You see, we have to be temperate in all things, the Bible tells us. Jesus, the first temptation Jesus faced in Matthew chapter 4 was over food. Why do you think it was over food? Because the devil knows we can lose our salvation based on what we eat. He knows that the best way to have access to us, to our mind, is through what we eat, what we put into the body. That is one of the ways that the devil can have access to you. So we have to understand the issues here. That is the reason why God, through the writings of Ellen White, God gave the Seventh-day Adventist Church the knowledge, the truth about diet reform health reform so that we may be a peculiar people a wise people you see the children of israel after god brought them out of egypt they were in bondage to the egyptian they were in a custom in eating all kinds of food that was not good for them but when god brought them out of egypt into the wilderness Genesis chapter 6, or chapter 16 rather, God tells us, the Bible tells us, the diet that God gave them. It was a pure plant-based diet. God removed the Babylonian, the Egyptian diet from their lives. And God said through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 8, why he gave them that diet. He said, Men shall live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But before that, it says that God caused thee to go hungry in the wilderness, and he fed thee with manna. Manna, that was angel's food, a plant-based food. So that ye might know that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the Bible tells us the reason why God allowed the children of Israel to go hungry, He caused them to fast in the wilderness, and then He gave them the manna so that they might understand spiritual things better. So that they might understand what? Spiritual things better. You see, the Bible, the Word of God, is a spiritual book. It's not like any other book. In order to understand the Word of God, our mind must be sharp. The Holy Spirit must be able to have access to the mind, to the body. But if the body, if we are eating things that will defile the body, that would clog the mind, then we will not be able to understand spiritual things. That is one of the reasons why God has given us the health message, which, by the way, is the right arm of the third angel's message. You know the third angel's message? Revelation chapter 14, verses 9, and all the way down to verse 12, which warns us from receiving the mark of the beast, and it also warns us from worshiping the image of the beast. It warns us from worshiping the beast itself. And in order for us to understand this, the mind must be sharp. God gave the children of Israel a pure plant-based diet so that they might understand spiritual things. But they complain against God. They would not adhere to the health reform that God was giving to them, which was for their own good, which was for their own salvation. And so, we do not want to be like the children of Israel and complain because we love certain food. You see, all these things the Apostle Paul says 
were written for our admonition. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Upon whom the end of the world has come. So there is more to just listening to the prophecies. But there is a preparation that needs to be made in us. We have to be practical people as well. And the Bible tells us, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 days or 40 years, the Bible says there was no sickness among them. Why? What made the difference? Because of the diet. They did not eat anything that came from animal. They were not chasing after chicken to cut their heads and to eat the chickens. They were not doing that. The Bible says there was no sickness among them. Now keep in mind, this was their preparation. That's part of the reform. Their preparation before they go to inherit Canaan. Likewise, before we enter heaven, before we go back again to the Garden of Eden, we need to learn and to adapt to the original diet. That's why the first angel's message says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. So we need to fear God above everything. Let me read for you a passage from Manuscript 73, 1908. God requires continual advancement from His people. They need to learn that indulgent appetite, indulge appetite is the greatest hindrance to mental improvement and soul sanctification. As a people, with all our profession of health reform, we eat too much. Indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility and lies largely at the foundation of feebleness and premature death. Intemperance begins our tables when we use an unwise combination of foods. Let the individual who is seeking to possess purity of spirit, bear in mind that in Christ there is power to control the appetite. We need to control the appetite. Let me explain a little bit more what that means based on what I just read. For example, if we eat something this morning, let's say breakfast, your breakfast is supposed to be your biggest meal. After you have that meal, you should not be snacking in between. You have to allow your body, your digestive system, four and a half to five hours to digest the food. The only thing that should enter the body during that time before your next meal is just water or juice. Because you see, it takes four and a half hours to five hours for your digestive system to digest the breakfast or your first meal or second meal, whichever meal that is. So it takes that long. Now, here's the problem. If you don't give your digestive system time to digest the food, and let's say two hours after your meal, you go and snack on something, you eat something. What happened is your digestive system now stop from digesting the food the breakfast or the meal you just had before, two hours ago, and now it's going to try to digest the snack. Now, what happened to the first meal that you had? Well, it does not go back to digest it anymore. It just stays there. Now, it becomes acidic into the body, and it starts giving you all kinds of health problems. And sometimes we don't realize, we say, okay, Lord, what happened to me? I don't know why I'm sick. I don't know why this is happening to me. Well, perhaps it has something to do with what you eat and how you eat. You have to give the body time to digest the food. You see, think of your digestive system 
like an engine of a vehicle or the transmission of a vehicle. You have to feed it with the right thing. You have to put the right oil in it. You see? And you cannot use it continuously without a break. If you do that, well, the engine or the transmission, chances are it's going to break down. You understand? Yes. It's going to break down. So think of your body the same way. Think about your body the same way. You have to give the body time. And that's what God was doing to the children of Israel in the wilderness. God had a specific time for them to eat. You cannot eat whenever you want to. You have to give your body time to rest, to digest the food, and to wait for the next meal. Let me read you another passage. In our work, more attention should be given to the temperance reform. Every duty that calls for reform involves repentance, faith, and obedience. It means the uplifting of the soul to a new and nobler life. Thus, every true reform has its place in the third angel's message. You see, and that is connected with the third angel's message. The, the health reform is connected with the third angel's message. So it's more than just not receiving the mark of the beast. It's more than just not worshipping the beast and his image. But in order for us to get to that point, we have to have a sharp, clear mind to be able to discern those things. And it goes on to say, especially does the temperance reform demand our attention and support at our camp meetings, like we're having here. At our camp meetings, we should call attention to this work. What is the work? Health reform, temperance reform. And make it a living issue. We should present to the people the principles of true temperance and call for signers to the temperance pledge. Careful attention should be given to those who are enslaved by evil habits. We must lead them to the cross of Christ. This evil must be more boldly met in the future than it has been in the past. Ministers and doctors should set forth the evil of intemperance. So our camp meeting, she said, we should be talking about temperance reform, health reform. Because, you know, at our camp meeting is a time when we should be drawing much closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. Think of camp meeting like the children of Israel camping in the wilderness. Think of it that way. And as they were camping in the wilderness, God changed their diet. He removed the Egyptian, the Babylonian diet from them. You see, when you look at the sanctuary that the children of Israel, the portable sanctuary that the children of Israel built in the wilderness. You have three apartments. Do you know what the three apartments are? You have the outer court. You have the holy place. And you have the most holy place. How many apartments? Three. What are they? Outer court, holy place, most holy place. In the outer court, you had meat offerings. It's where the sinner will bring his offering, his lamb, an animal, to be offered for his sin. Now you have meat offering in the outer court. But when the priest enters the holy place, what was in there? Was there meat inside the holy place? No. Inside of the holy place, you have the seven candlesticks. You have the altar of incense. And then you have the table of showbread. Now, the table of showbread, it had baked bread on it. Now, pay attention now. In the outer court, you had what? Meat offering. In the holy place, you had what? What kind of food did you find in the holy place? Bread. Baked bread. Now, when the 
high priest enters the most holy place once a year, what kind of food do you find in the most holy place? In the most holy place, you had uh, almonds, Aaron uh, rod that budded almonds. You had manna. And then you had the pomegranate that was around the priest's belt. So you had a pure plant-based diet in the most holy place. Now, who was there in the most holy place? The most holy place, another name for that, the Shekinah glory, that, that's where God was. So here's the point. The closer you get to God, the diet must change. Out of court, meat offering. Holy place, bread, baked food. In the most holy place where God was, it was a pure plant-based diet. You had manna, almonds, pomegranate. No meat, no dairy, nothing. This was like going back to the Garden of Eden again. That is part of the plan of salvation. Did you know that? Part of the plan of salvation that God wants us to go back to the way the diet was in the Garden of Eden. Let me read you another passage. As we approach the close of earth's history, selfishness, violence, and crime prevail as in the days of Noah. And the cause is the same. What is it? The excessive indulge of the appetites and passions. How we form in the habits of life is especially needed at this time in order to fit people for the coming of Christ. You see it? A reform is needed in order to fit a people for the coming of Christ. The Savior himself warns the church, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. That's Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Let me continue to read another passage here. Hygiene reform. Now, let me pause here. What is hygiene reform? What is hygiene? Can anybody tell me what, what's hygiene? Cleanliness. Cleanliness. Cleanliness, right? Cleaning the body, right? Now, it's not just what you put on the inside, what you eat, but also the outside, right? Hygiene. We have to make sure we keep the body clean. We, we, we bathe. We have to make sure that we take care of it inwardly, outwardly. That is very important because remember, God wants to have his angels around us. Also remember, our body is not ours. God has given it to us to take care of it. And guess what? If you take care of the body, if God can trust you to take care of this body, then He can trust you with a glorified body. Amen? Amen. Then He will be able to trust you. So before God could trust you with a glorified body, that means when we get to heaven and the earth made new, before He can trust you with a glorified body, He must first trust you with this body. You must first take care of this body before he could give you a glorified body. Makes sense, right? Let me continue to read. Hygiene reform is a subject that we need to understand in order to be prepared for the events that are close upon us. Notice, in order to be prepared for the event that are close upon us. It is a branch of the Lord's work which has not received the attention it deserves. And much has been lost. Through neglect, it should have a prominent place. It is not a matter to be trifled with, to be passed over as non-essential, or to be treated as a jest. If the church would manifest a greater interest in this reform, that is hygiene reform, their influence for good would be greatly increased. 
for those who are looking for the coming of the Lord, for those who are called to be laborers in his vineyard, for all who are fitting themselves for a place in the heavenly everlasting kingdom, how important that the brain be clear and the body as free as possible from disease. And that is the reason why, as we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible tells us, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. My brothers and my sisters, God wants us to be reformers. Not just reformers in some things, but reformers in all things. It's not enough for us to just not be under the general conference of seven Adventists, but we have to also show that we are reformers in what we eat, the way we take care of the body, because you go to the many conference churches, those things are not being taught. They are not being preached there. People don't understand what health reform is, even dress reform. So by God's grace, we will talk more another time about this. But for now, remember, remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Before you do anything, I would like for you to memorize that passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So that it might help you in anything, in everything. What does the passage say again? Whatsoever ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father God, which art in heaven, help us, Lord, to be true reformers as you have called us to be. Help us, Father, to remember before we do anything, to remember to ask if it's your will, because we want to please you, we want to glorify you. Help us, Lord, not to fall into the same temptation that Eve fell into. Help us to seek you first in all things. To find out if whatever it is will glorify you. Help us to glorify you in all things. Because that is the plan of salvation. To give you glory that you alone deserve. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen? Amen. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 say again? What, whatsoever, whatsoever you what eat or drink. And or whatsoever ye do, what else? Do it all to the glory of God. God bless you.